Mark chapter 2. Don't forget Brother Strong's going to be with us Thursday, Friday, Saturday at 7 o'clock uh, each night at 7 o'clock. Uh, 6 o'clock just so early for folks to get around. So 7 o'clock on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, then next Sunday uh, he'll be with us. Brother uh, Styles is going to be with us the first Sunday of Easter. Uh, the first Sunday of Easter. How many Sundays are there in Easter? But anyway, um, the first Sunday of April, Brother Styles is going to be with us. And so uh, look forward to that. Mark chapter 2 tonight. I'm glad to see you back out this evening. And uh, glad for that lady that came this morning. Amen. That rode her snowmobile to church. And uh, of course, people tell you anything. She said, oh, that was a great sermon. A model sermon, a uh, picture of the real thing. But anyway, she said, I'm going to bring the rest of my family back. Uh, I hope so, but uh, they're from Pennsylvania, but so we were glad that they came uh, today. Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2. Let's stand, shall we? As we read this account, you find it again also in, in the Gospel of Luke. It's also in, in Matthew, but we shall read from Mark. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noise that he was in the house. It's the right way many were gathered together, and so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and they let, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and took up his bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. And so, now Lord, thank you again for your word tonight. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless it to our hearts and Lord, the reading of it. Father, again, we thank you so very much for the opportunity one more time, Lord, to be here. Who knows, Lord? This may be our last time. But, Lord, we're thankful again for tonight. Lord, we look at the world situation, the fighting going on around the world. Lord, we're reminded that nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom uh, at the end. Lord, we see that. We most assuredly see that. Lord, we wonder, oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long, ere we shout the glad song, Christ returneth. Lord, maybe that this week will be the week that you come. Lord, we don't know. But help us be looking because we are reminded, oh, Lord, we're reminded that those that are looking and that love thy appearing shall receive that crown of righteousness. Help us, Lord, we pray. Again, I thank you for the folks who have come back out tonight. And Lord Jesus, we would pray that, Lord, you would increase our number. Lord, not for our glory but for the glory of our Christ and our Lord and soon coming King, that his name will be glorified and lifted up. Again, Lord, we're thankful for what we can do. Help us to do what we can do. Lord, not to try to do more than what we can do, but to do what we can do. And so, Lord, we're thankful again. We are thankful for this evening. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the good morning we had together. And, Lord, we now thank you for this night. So, Lord, bless, we pray in these few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You may be seated. 
Uh, somebody, someone said, good-naturedly, really it was good-naturedly, man, you got kind of long this morning, didn't you? Uh, no, we're not pointing at anybody. We're not pointing fingers at anybody tonight. We're not pointing any fingers. But, you know, it's, you know, this is how I feel. Really, this is how I feel. I get you for like two hours on Sunday, and I got to nail you. And so, you know, it's like... Sometimes, just anyway, Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2. Tonight, a, a familiar story, might look at it, I'm trying to find something different in it, but look at it just a little bit differently. How do we know, how do we know, how do we know what kind of a, of a church is the right kind of church? There are all kinds of churches all over America, I mean, there are churches everywhere, and if you've ever been down south, at all. You know that old saying, there's a Baptist church on every street corner, and that is just about the truth, but not quite, because not only is there a Baptist church on every street corner, but there's one in the middle of the street, too. I mean, they're like everywhere, I mean, but they're like 27 different flavors of them. Uh, there's Independent Baptist, there's Southern Baptist, there's American Baptist, there's First Church, the Four Square Gospel, the Apostolic Faith Baptist. I mean, Seventh day, there are all kinds of Baptist churches, and then, then there are all kinds of other churches in between. There are lots of different churches, and, and uh, we're not saying, okay, well, only the Baptist church is right. Uh, we're not saying that, but uh, how do you know if, if you got into a, a good church? Now, we're not talking about the standards, we're not talking about anything. How do we know that when, when, we, when we get into a good church? What is it that we're looking for in a church? What is it that we're looking for in the gospel account tonight? And Mark, I think we might see it. Now, again, there are churches all over the world. But in Revelation chapter 3, it indicates to us that in the last days, look at Revelation 3 for a minute. We'll come right back to Mark. But look at Revelation chapter 3. In his description of the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, in chapter 3, we find the last church. I, I really do think, because I, I, I believe that the, the book of Revelation is prophetical, and that when it says in Revelation chapter 1, write the things which thou hast, the things which are, the things which thou hast seen, and the things which shall be hereafter. I kind of misquoted it, but write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. It is clearly, and I mean clearly, denoted in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, come up hither and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. So if Revelation is divided, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter, we can pretty much write it down from chapter 4, verse 1 after that. That are the things that are yet to take place. Write the things which thou hast seen in chapter 1. He gives a description of the glorified Christ. In chapters 2 and 3, he writes the things which are. In my opinion, as we look at it, and I think we can rightfully say it, it's a picture of the church age, the age in which we live. There are seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Now, we have noted many times the number of seven means completion. So there are going to be seven types of churches that will fulfill the church age in order. And you can, and I people have had, and I'm not going to do that tonight, but uh, people have uh, uh, equated, we can use that word, the first church, the church at Ephesus, to the apostolic church, the church at the very beginning, um, ES, and then there is Smyrna, and then the uh, ESP, then there is uh, uh, Pergamos, and then there is Thyatira, and those all picture a different time period of the last 2,000 years. Now, I think they can picture churches today. I think that they can picture individuals, that you can say, well, that person is a Laodicean, or that person is an, uh, an Ephesus, of an Ephesian. There's a lot of good things about the Ephesians, but they had left their first love. I remember Dr. McKnight always said this to me, said a lot of things to me. He said, cut your mustache for one thing, but anyway, we're not going there tonight, but he said a lot of things to me. He, he said, if you can do anything else other than be a preacher, do that. If you can do anything else other than be a preacher, do that. I didn't understand what he meant by that at the time I do now. But he said this to me. Call me Jim. 
He said, Jim, he said, you can get so busy doing for God that you have no time to be with God. He said, make sure you always have some time to be with God. The Ephesians were so busy doing for God that they didn't have a lot of time to be with him. Somebody says, well, that guy's an Ephesian. Man, he's busy for Jesus. But, but anyway, and so the last church, chapter 7, we're going to run out of time again. In chapter 3, verse 14, the seventh church. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Everything about in these seven churches, you'll always find a description at the very beginning of the seven churches, a description of Christ. Then in verse 15, I know thy works, but thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. I said, I wish you were cold or hot, one or the other. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The last church, the church of the Laodiceans, makes, makes Christ sick. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither corn or spew verse 17, because thou sayest, why are they lukewarm? What is it that they're lukewarm about? It says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, here's the thing about the last church. The old I stand at the door and knock. Here's the thing about the last church. He is, Jesus is neither in the church, nor is he welcome in the church. The old I stand at the door and knock. I realize that many times we apply this uh, when we're out, when you try and talk to someone. Say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. The, the characteristic of the church of, at the last day is that Christ is neither in the church nor is he welcome. You say, well, preacher, how can that be? There are churches. Look, there are, there are so-called churches all over the world. I mean, the things that have church, everything. Well, as I said, the, first, the four square gospel, the, the full gospel, apostolic, Four square of the latter day apostles, Baptist, Episcopal, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran church. I mean, there, there are all kinds of churches all across the world. You say, Well, preacher, how do you know what's a good church? What is a good church? How do we know if, if our church is a good church? What is it that we're trying to see? Why is it that churches at this late hour? They're standing there and Jesus knocking on the door trying to get into the church. What, why is that? I, I'm, I'm reminded of that old, it's old story, but, but uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, his name was Gordon. I know his last name was Gordon. Uh, A.J. Gordon, Adirondack Judson Gordon. He was a Baptist preacher and he said he had a dream one night, and then I'm not a big one on dreams, but he said he had a dream one night, and he was preaching, and the church was full. And he said sometime during the service, the door opened, and a stranger came in the back of the church. And the was full, and he came in, and he sat up there where Mrs. Ward's setting, and up toward the front. And after uh, he got done preaching, he tried to see the guy, but he couldn't. So he asked the person who was sitting next to him, he said, who was that that came to church today? And the guy said to him, well, don't you know? He said, that was the Lord Jesus that came to our church today. He said, and again, I'm not a big one on dreams. Gordon said that particular dream really changed his life in a lot of ways because it made him realize that Jesus was at the service. But there are a lot of churches where Jesus is not welcome in the church. They're religious. They're religious. They're re look, in our account, if you look back at Mark chapter 2, look back at Mark chapter 2, 
it tells us there in, in verse 6 of chapter 2, but there were certain other scribes sitting there and reasoning in the heart. Look, there were some religious people there. They were religious. Look, it was the religious crowd that killed them. So how can we tell? Just because a building has church after the name doesn't mean it's a church. Just because somebody says, well, I go to such and such church. Uh, you want to welcome me into your church? Look, just because somebody goes to church doesn't mean they're a Christian. I've said before, look, we've, we've come to a place in, in America, in a lot of places, where, hey, just throw your arms around everybody and say, boy, we're glad to have you. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or not. We were talking in Sunday school. Pete prayed a little prayer this morning. Dear Lord, I want to go to heaven when I die. Amen. But that doesn't mean somebody's a Christian because they prayed some little prayer like that. But I will say this. It is with a heart, man, believe in the right. Now, how do we know? How do we know? Let me quickly, because I'll try not to keep it too late. I, I, how do we know tonight? How do we know? Well, this. How do we know a good church? One, when the word of God is preached. David said when he got to... Um, I can't remember the priest's name. The priest of Nob is who they were. And he said to them, you got anything to eat here? And he said, well, we've only got the showbread, but that's only for the, uh, the Levites, for the sons of Aaron and the Levites to eat. But it's hot and it's fresh. And uh, David said, well, give it to me because I don't have really anything else to eat. And the Lord Jesus, in, in I believe Matthew chapter 12, seemed to say, well, it was okay for David to get it under the circumstance because he was being chased by Saul. But the Word of God ought to be hot, and it ought to be fresh, and it ought to say something. It ought to do something in my heart and your heart. But, but how do we know a good church? Well, the Word of God, the pure Word of God is being preached. I'm not talking about the King James Bible tonight, but hey, we can go there if you want. Where the Word of God is preached, where it is preached. So really, I, I hear lots of guys preach, and a lot of times if I know they're not using the King James Bible, I, I, I really don't listen to them. And, I read a lot of books, and if they're not using the King James Bible, I just kind of uh, pass over when they get to Scripture. But how do we know a good church? Look, if you would, at verse 3. Look at verse 3, if you would. And they come unto him and bring one sick. When the word of God is preached, people are drawn. Verse 7 tells us this. Why does man speak blasphemy? Not only when the word of God is preached, people get disturbed. They get disturbed over the word of God. I believe Brother Pete Shear told me that uh, the guy that, that owns the radio station uh, said to him, uh, I, I, wish, I wish he wouldn't say some of the things that he says. Now, I don't know what I've ever said on there that was highly offensive to somebody, but, but he just says, I wish he wouldn't say some of the things that he would say. Well, good night, the guy that used to be on there before. Dave, Dave told me that there used to be another guy on there before me who was always ridiculing the Word of God. Why is it that people can ridicule the Word of God, but if somebody preaches the Word of God, people get disturbed about that? The scribes got disturbed because the Word of God was being preached. But not only that, notice if you would in verse 11. I say unto thee, arise. Not only are, are, are people drawn, not only are people disturbed, but people are delivered when the Word of God is preached. I've said many times. I went to a church for years. I went to a lot of different churches. We went to the local church wherever we lived. When we lived in Armistead Gardens at 5152 Wright Avenue, we went to the community church. When we lived in Bryansville, Pennsylvania, we went to the Evangelical United Brethren Church. When we lived in Maryland, we went to the United Methodist Church. I mean, we just went to whatever church was handy. But I can honestly say, in all the times that all those churches that I ever went to, I never saw one person that was delivered. He said, well, you probably weren't looking. No, I probably wasn't. But I can honestly say I cannot honestly remember one person ever being saved. I've said before, I imagine this fellow is probably dead now. The last church that we went to after, before my dad got saved, I doubt if that preacher even knew what it meant to be saved. I, I, I cannot remember. 
I was somewhere. I was in I was in San Angelo, Texas, and I'd been out and I was out knocking on doors. And I knocked on a man's door, and he said, "Come in." And we we talked for a while. He's very friendly. And I got down to the end, and you know, you always try to be friendly when you go into somebody's house. And, I said to him, I said, sir, may I ask you a question? He said, sure, go ahead. I said, if you die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? He became very, and I mean very indignant. He stood up. His couch was kind of out in the middle of the floor. He got up, walked behind his couch, and put both hands on the back of the couch. I can still see him. He put both hands on the back of the couch, and he said, I've been a preacher. I think he told me for 11 years. It's either 11 or 17 years. He put his hands on the back of the couch, and he grabbed it, and he said, I have never in my life ever seen in the Bible where you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. Now, he was a preacher, he, and he, he said, I didn't know you could find the Bible. I talked to a man one night, a man now since passed away. He said, I go to church. And he said, never one time have I ever heard anybody say, you have to be born again to go to heaven. Now, the man eventually died and passed away. But look, just because it says it's a church, what happens in a, in a good church? In a good church, what happens? Well, just like here in this, this account of this man, people are delivered. Here was this man who was, couldn't walk. The press was so great, they tore a hole in the roof, let the guy down. And uh, Jesus said, thy faith, notice what Jesus said, son, thy sins be forgiven. Now, they became very indignant at that. And he said, well, who can forgive sins? What is this guy? Who does this guy think he is? He claimed to be God. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's John chapter 6. I'm almost positive it's chapter 6 of John. We won't look at it. But Jesus said, for what good work do you stone me? And they said, for a good work we stone thee not, but because thou makest thyself to be God, we stone thee. They said, well, who can forgive sins? In verse 7, why does this man speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? Who is this guy to say, uh, thy sins are forgiven? When, when the word of God is preached, people are drawn, people get disturbed, but people get delivered from their sins. Remember, don't remember that old song? I don't think we sing it very much. Oh, happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. You remember the day that you... You realized you were lost and you realized that you needed a Savior and, and you called upon him and he saved you and he delivered your soul. You say, preacher, that was a great day. Now, maybe you didn't understand everything. I know I certainly did not. But the, that old song, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows, is so true that as we go down the road, we say, man, I'm so thankful that I have been delivered and that he delivered me. He is able to deliver thee, though by sin oppressed. Come to him for rest. My God is able to deliver thee. In, in a true church, in a, in a real church, the word of God is preached and people are delivered. Now you say, well, preacher, we don't see people delivered every Sunday. Boy, I wish we did see people saved every Sunday. Amen. I'll tell you, that would be a thrill to see folks saved every single Sunday. But I realize, number one, where we live. I no realize, number two, the age in which we live. I remember the story of Ruth. And in that story, she went through the field. Boaz said, look, leave, leave some of the barley there for her, okay, fellas? You, you leave some of that barley. Because Boaz kind of got sweet on her, and he said, the, you, you leave some of that. And The main harvest had already occurred. Did you think the main harvest? I, if, if we understand the Bible and the church of Philadelphia... Jesus said, I have opened the door and no man can shut it. The great harvest of souls, great revivals, great evangelists uh, swept the nation, swept the world. Great missionaries went out. I believe the great harvest is probably past. But I believe that there are some gleanings still left in the field to be found. I understand that, that we live in upstate New York. New England is called the deathbed of churches because it's so cold. And I don't mean physically cold, but spiritually cold. 
People don't want to hear the gospel. We're living in the last day. People don't want to hear the gospel. Again, if you knock on ten doors tonight, nine of them would probably say, I'm not interested in what you got. But in a church, the word of God is preached. People are drawn. Other people are going to get disturbed. They don't like what you preach. You got to be born again. I never saw anywhere where you got to be born again. I don't think you got to be born again. Well, the Bible says this. You must be born again. Amen. That's what the Bible says. And then there's deliverance. There is deliverance. Sinners get pardoned in verse 5. When the word of God is preached, sinners are pardoned. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Aren't you glad you're saved? No, come on. Aren't you glad you're saved? Amen. Look. Brother Angles uh, was saying, and, and I know it's true. Look, this is a different culture than down south. I mean, I, I know it's different. Uh, it's just different down south. People shout. They run up down the aisles. And, and I'm not expecting it. If, if Alex got up and ran up down the aisle, somebody probably would tackle him. Say, what's the matter with him? He's done. He's lost it. Uh, but if, you know, down south, they run the aisles. Really, they run up down the aisles. They have, they have guys. They have several. several and, and they're not designated guys. They just have some guys sitting on the front row all the time down there shouting, waving handkerchiefs, waving their hand. I mean, they're excited about Jesus. Amen. Somebody says, and I said this last Sunday, somebody says, you know, uh, hey, uh, Jesus never got excited like that. Jesus never ran up and down. Jesus never got excited about being saved. No, he did. Or about, about that? No, he didn't. But the people he touched did. Brother, they got excited about their sins being gone. They got excited. That old maniac of Gadara, that lunatic who beat people up and all the time running around naked and, and they tried to put chains on him, and they tried to tie him up, and he was always cutting himself, and he was always crying. Boy, when he was delivered, man, he went home. When I read this morning, I believe it was right there, look in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Look at verse 44. Verse 44. This is about the old leper. Now, brother, there's a guy that was dying, and Jesus touched him, and he was healed. And verse 44, see thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for testimony unto them. Jesus told him what to do. He said in verse 44, hey, don't tell anybody. Just don't, don't tell anybody. Just go down to the priest, tell them, tell them that you've been healed of leprosy, I believe that the prescribed mosaic offering was two pigeons, that if you got healed of leprosy, you offered up two pigeons, the priest had to verify that you were healed of leprosy and offer up two pigeons. Now let's just keep this quiet. Let's not get excited about it. Now, now mark it down. The guy was dying. He was dying. There was no hope for him. He, he said, okay. No, that isn't what happened. Look at verse 45. But he went out and began to publish it, publish it much. I mean, he didn't keep it quiet. He got excited that he had been delivered. We say, well, preacher, you know, Jesus never got excited. Well, I guarantee you, if you read through the Gospels, people that got delivered, they got excited because they had been delivered. If somebody came up to you and said, well, you got cancer, but I got the cure. Be healed. And you got up and your cancer was gone. You probably run up down the aisle too. Ah, but this guy was delivered. The man born of, of the four. Now you'll notice what else went about this. In verse 4. How do you know what kind of church? One, the word is preached. Secondly, sinners are pardoned. But in order for sinners to be pardoned, there's got to be some crowd participation. 
Again, I, I, I want to encourage you. I do want to encourage you. I realize that most of the time people will not respond in a favorable manner if you invite them to church. I, I realize that they will not do that. I, I know that. I invite people. I invite them all the time. They say, yeah, I'll come. No, I wouldn't come to your church. I don't know what it is about our church. They say, I would never come to your church. It's like we're killing people on a weekly basis and burying them out back or something. But no, I, I, I would never come to your church. I wouldn't come to your church. You people are weird over there. Well, okay, so we are. We, we want to, but peculiar is a better word. If they say you're weird, tell them no, peculiar is a better word. Because the Bible says we're a peculiar people. But anyway, for sinners to be delivered, the word has got to be preached. But there's got to be some participation by others. That other people. How did that guy get there? He certainly did not walk. Those four men brought him in, and when they got to the door, the Bible says the pressure was so great, nobody could even get in the door. I mean, there were so many people that see Jesus, they could not get in the door. And so the four guys, and, and instead of being discouraged, instead of saying, ah, well, what's the use? They said, we've got to get this man to Jesus. We've got to get our friend to Jesus. Folks, you, you understand and realize that people are dying every day without Christ. I, I, I wish, and I shouldn't say wish, but I, 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 I would say we should pray. We should pray. Matt gave me the statistic one time, 500 million people, never been, never been prayed for. Five million people, whatever, never been prayed for. Pray that God would would send somebody our way to cross our path. I know the great harvest is probably past, but there are still gleanings out there. There are still some people out there. Hey, you got saved. There's other people that may. Look, the four guys said, we've got to get him to Jesus. I don't care how we get him to Jesus. We've got to get him to Jesus. Somebody said, well, we better go up on the roof. And let's tear a hole in the roof. They went up to tore a hole in the roof. And they let the guy down. When the word of God is, is preached, People are drawn, some are disturbed, but there is deliverance. Sinners are pardoned, but there has got to be participation by you and I. We need to do our best for the master. Have we done our best for the master? Not only that, but notice again in verse 4. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof. Not only is there participation, but there's some persistence here. They're persistent about it. Well, I invited somebody to church once, and they didn't come, so I didn't invite them again. A long time ago, like 40 years ago, probably 40 years ago, may have been 41, I don't remember. It's too long. I asked her for a date, and she said no. I can't understand that. I mean, dynamic personality that I am. She said, no. Okay. <laughs> Too bad for you. <laughs> On to the next one. Nah, I didn't do that. I asked her again. And you know what she said? No. She said no. I'm thinking there's something really wrong with her, and maybe I ought to move on, but I asked her a third time. Now, I, I, I kind of had this rule. If I asked somebody out three times, they said no, then I, I really did, though. No. I asked her a third time. I thought of something generic. Hey, you want to go see the Orioles play? I, little did I know that she hates baseball. I mean, she hates baseball. But I guess by this time she's figured out, wow. I'll go to the baseball game with him. What, what persistence. And, and lo and behold, I don't know if you can remember. I don't know if you remember. Alex, I don't know if you remember where you were when you asked her to marry you. I don't know where, where you were when you said, said to them, uh, will you marry me? 
I can remember very clearly. We were on the back row, the seat of the scornful. We were on the back row of the balcony. Brother, I sat as far away from the front as I could get. We were on the back row of the balcony. I think it was before church. Could have been during church. No, it wasn't during church. But it was before church. Thomas Road Baptist Church, Lynchburg, Virginia, on a Sunday night. Now, she didn't say no. But suppose I had to quit the first time I had asked her out. I could have got stuck with a real nut, not just a pretend one. I could have, if I, if I had not been persistent, if I had not been persistent in it. Where the word of God is preached, people are going to be drawn, sinners are going to be delivered, people are going to be pardoned, but there, there's got to be participation and there's got to be some persistence to it. Why ask them once? Well, ask them again. I doubt if he's watching, but I'll say it. I've asked Kevin Burdick to come to church here, I bet, 50 times. He always says, I wouldn't come to your church. But that doesn't stop me from asking. Because he's got a soul. People have souls. And people are dying every day. You know what Jesus said? He said, uh, uh, the, the, the Lord said, oh, look, uh, the, the feast is now ready. Go bid those that were, that were invited. Those people who were invited to come to the feast, you go invite them. And the servants came back and said, well, they don't want to come. He said, well, go out and find somebody else. And they went out and they said, Master, Lord, there's still room for them to come. So he said to them, go out to the highways and the hedges. And notice what he said, and compel Compel means to make. When they didn't want to get into the boat, Jesus compelled them to get into the boat. He made them get into the boat. Now, I'm not saying beat them up, tie them up, and drag them in the church in a sack and put them on the back row. But the Bible says compel them. There's got to be some participation on my part and your part. When the word of God is preached, notice if you would, verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, when he saw their faith, there was some persuasion going on there. When he saw their faith, he saith unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, in a real church, and again, I'm not limiting to our church, but in a real church where the word is preached and sinners are pardoned, in a real church, a good church, right kind of church, the Savior is being praised. Notice, lastly, about it. Immediately he rose, took up his bed, and went forth before them all, and so much that they were all amazed, and they glorified God. Look, in a, in a church, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. When we give testimony, the word testimony means to repeat something. If I go to court, say, uh, they said, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, to God, and to give uh, sworn testimony? Yeah, I'll do that. Testimony means to repeat a story means to repeat something, repeat an account. In a church, the Savior ought to be being praised for the things that he has done for us. That's what a testimony is. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Lord, thank you for our answers to prayer this week. Lord, thank you for safety this week. Lord, thank you for working in my life this week. Look, in, in a church, in a church, Jesus ought to be praised. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. The book of James says that every good and perfect gift proceeds down from the Father of lights with whom there is, in whom there is no variableness nor neither shadow of turning. Hebrews 13, I believe it's verse 8. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He is worthy to be praised. Revelation 4 and verse 11. For thou alone art worthy, thou alone art worthy to receive power and praise. I believe is how that verse goes. Look, in a good church, people are praising God. I know not everybody is the preacher. Some people are very quiet. I know that. Um, we have quiet people in our church. Not everybody is expressive. I like saying amen. I, I just like doing that. When I was first saved, maybe I didn't say it very much. But I like saying amen now. 
I've, I've, I've been tempted to run up down the aisles a couple times, but I didn't want you to tackle me and tie me up. Just to praise the Savior for what he's done. God is so good. You know, we're, we're singing that song for Easter. Uh, we've got a lot of altos and sopranos. We could use a few more basses. I can hardly sing that song. I don't know if I can sing that song. We shall behold him. We shall behold him. Face to face in all his glory. He is so good. And we shall behold him. The sky shall unfold to prepare him an entrance. The king is coming. In a good church, right kind of church, the Savior is being praised. People praise him. Again, I know that not everybody is outgoing. The preacher is not outgoing. If you know the preacher, if you know him, he is not an outgoing kind of guy. But I am when it comes to Jesus. Amen. That's something to be outgoing about. Right kind of church, people, the Savior will be praised. The man walked in, in verse 12. What a miracle that was. And, people, and everybody said, wow. We never saw anything like that before. As it says there in verse 12, we never saw it on this fashion. What that means is this. Man, we never saw anything like that before. Guy let down through the roof. Boy, that was something. But for that guy to say to him, thy sins are forgiven, or take up thy bed and walk, the guy takes up his bed and, and he puts it on his shoulder. Boy, we never saw anything like that before. And they glorified God. Brethren, when sinners get saved and the word of God is preached, we, all, we have got something to praise God about. Right kind of church tonight. How to know it. Mark 2. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your goodness to us. Lord, help us to be the right kind of church. Lord, we want to be the right kind of church. Lord, we do not want you have to stand outside and knock to come in. Lord, if that's the case, I'm going outside. Lord, I don't want to be a church where you're not at. Lord, I, I, I pray, Lord, that you'll help us be the right kind of church to continually, constantly, consistently preach the word of God. And Lord, I know, Lord, probably in the parable of the sower, the 100-fold, 60-fold, 30-fold, and the one parable was a decreasing order. I know that we're living in a Laodicean age and that there are a lot of churches where Jesus isn't even preached. Help us not to be discouraged by that. But help us to have some participation and be persistent in the matter that we might be able to see some folks saved. I know that not everybody will be saved. I know that very few will be saved. But some will be saved. So Lord, help us that in, in this church, whether it's me or a missionary or one of our men, Lord, to consistently preach the word of God that sinners will be drawn. Lord, we pray. Bless us as we go home now tonight. Lord, I pray for traveling mercies. And Lord, give us a good week. Give us a good prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Look forward to it already, Lord, for what you have for us. Lord, bless our week, we pray, and, and uh, keep us safe. Lord, I know that we travel, and people work, and sometimes they have to, are in harm's way. And we just pray for each one here tonight, Lord, that you'll keep us safe. Bless us, we pray, until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.